everyone a chance to to join us. Uh, we see the numbers coming in. We hope you, I hope you've had a great first week. Let's see, they're still coming in. Fantastic. And as we're waiting for people to come in, I'm just going to introduce myself. I'm Eva Marie Rodriguez Morris. I teach art history in the Emeritus Institute, and I will be the moderator for our guest lecture series this spring. So super excited about that. And let's see, I'm just looking at our numbers and they're still climbing. So we're going to give everyone just a few moments to join. Okay, let me see here. All right, so while these numbers are coming in, uh, just a quick a couple of quick housekeepings just with the class um, to be sure to check out uh, the Canvas module every week. You'll learn a little bit more about our weekly speaker. And then also um, you will find the well, you obviously you found the Zoom link, but if you have friends in the class who might be having problems, uh, you will just have to click on the front page Zoom. A link. That's where it is. It's a little different because we are a webinar due to the size of our class size. So the numbers are still coming in. We're going to give everyone just about one more minute. Let's see, here we go. Okay. Checking those numbers. If you have any uh, questions, Feel free to put them in the uh, Q&A. The button's located right below you. Um, we've turned off chat, so there's no chat, but all questions are welcome. And we will be, you can ask them as we go through uh, the lecture today, and then we will be answering them at the end uh, with Dr. Spencer. So very excited. We're just gonna wait a couple more minutes. Not too many though, I promise. And let's see. All right, well, in the meantime, because I know Dr. Spencer is very excited and ready to share with us. So let me go ahead and we will get started. So welcome, welcome to spring. Oh, how sweet. Uh, welcome to uh, spring 2023, the Dorothy Marie Lowry Distinguished Guest Lecture Series. I am so excited. Uh, for our slate of speakers that we have ready for you this semester. And to get us started for week one is Dr. Rhonda Spencer Wayne. <laughs> so um, Dr. Spencer is an associate professor and epi epidemiologist at Loma Linda University and has been conducting groundbreaking research studying centurions and is the first to identify a, commu a community a resilient members despite their burdens of hardship and stressors, which is considered a resiliency capital region. Um, her uh, debut book, Raising Resilient Kids, was is targeting parents and grandparents and anyone interested in health. It was published in 2021. And Dr. Spencer has spent over 20 years of public health experience studying, publishing, giving presentations around the world, and is a recipient of millions of dollars in funding from various government agencies to conduct this research and to provide services. And in the field of higher education, that is a great feat, Dr. Spencer. So congratulations, uh, because we know those colleges love those research monies for sure. Um, her work is inspired by her family and her desire to promote a culture of health and resiliency for our nation and around the world. So everyone, I present Dr. Rhonda spencer Queen. Thank you so much for joining us and take it away. Thank you, I'm, thank you. I'm gonna go here and we're gonna share the screen. And um, are you guys able to see, let's see the slideshow. Um, okay, are you guys able to see the slideshow? Yes. I, okay, very good. I'm gonna kind of move you guys up here and we're gonna go to it. So today I'm going to talk about uh, reaching a vibrant 100 and it's advice from centenarians or these are folks who have lived 100 plus years um, and basically uh, in the longevity capital where I live. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. So 
I want to post you guys a question. Usually I have the chat open and I'm going to, I'm going to field these myself, but maybe you can just think about this in your head and, or share them with your impressions later that you guys write for the class. But how many of you have thought about living to a hundred, right? What would you be doing or um, where would you be going? How many of you have thought of living to a hundred or how many of you may have someone you know, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a friend or a colleague or someone at a church or something um, who is 100, right? How many of us know where I live is a very unique place. We have lots of people who have reached this 100 and they're still thriving. So um, very, very interesting. But for those of us who say, nah, 100 is too far off, I don't want to live to 100, but I want to be in good health for the remainder of my life. How many of you thought about that? Just, you know, um, being in good health, better mental clarity, meaning we want to reduce the likelihood that we have dementia or that, you know, uh, uh, Alzheimer's, or maybe we want to reduce the risk of, um, you know, aches and pains just from aging, right? Arthritis or things like that. So how many of you have thought about, mm, I wanna I wanna kind of slow those numbers, slow that aging, or um, if you are one in more of the beauty industry, maybe slowing the aging process. You wanna uh, look younger, stay physically fit longer. So how many of you, you can think, I can't see your hands, but I'm raising my hand. I'm one of those that um, want, want, it to, want to be in good health uh, for many years to come. So what gets in our way? And maybe, I don't know if you guys can put this in the Q&A or, or in your impressions later, thinking about what gets in our way of living the life we imagine for ourselves, right? So think about it for a moment. What gets in our way? What are those things that detract you from, from being able to, to live um, where you're aging more gracefully or increasing the likelihood that you might make it to 100 or stack the deck in your favor. What are those things that gets in your way? And there's a lot of them. Okay, so this was me. <clears throat> Many things getting in my way. About, oh, uh, going near 10 years ago now, this was me. I'm a young assistant professor at Loma Linda University running around. Um, I am a mom. My youngest at the time was one years old and I have three kids, various varying ages, and I'm a wife. I am a full-time assistant professor trying to climb the university ladder and just, I, I could feel the stress um, running to meetings, trying to get something to eat for my family. Um, and so my, my health, my mental well-being, everything was taking a backseat. And it all came crashing down one day when I was sitting in the was sitting in the pediatric doctor's office, and the pediatrician had just given me the latest bit of bad news that week. My son, his health was beginning to take a turn. He was increasing his weight. Um, his his uh, sugar, blood sugars were not the best, so we were really living kind of more this uh, frantic, hectic lifestyle. This was in addition to my own husband with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, his weight was increasing. And then I had gotten my own um, diagnosis of high cholesterol. So mind you, we live in this region where people are coming from around the world to see inside our pantries, to see what it takes, um, because we have this designation as this fountain of youth community here in Loma Linda. We will oftentimes, I will get a phone call from my boss and say, hey, we have a film crew coming from Belgium. Can they come to your house and will you take them on a tour for the day? So I would have to clean up. It would literally take me about a week, frantically clean my house, try to clean everything and get it just so. But meanwhile, the health numbers were telling me what you're doing is not working, right? Though at that time, you know, we are primarily, we eat more vegetarian. Um, so, but there, there's a disconnect, right? And I'm sure many people, when I asked around my colleagues and my friends, many could relate. And whether they were retired or not, um, many have this feeling of burning the candle at both ends. It was just stress, stressful. So let me ask you guys, and, and maybe you want to write about this in your impressions uh, for later. 
what are your stressor buttons these days? Thinking about what are those things that cause you stress in your life, right? And, um, you know, what are those things that maybe cause your family stressors, um, all kinds of, <clears throat> and, and these are a range of things. Um, we all face stressors, no matter whether we're um, students, whether we're career, working in our careers, or we're retired, there seems to be a never ending plethora of stressors. So before I talk about um, the, the known causes of stress, I want to kind of define how we define stress. Typically, if you talk to my friends that are in psychology, they're gonna say stress is with your relationships, it's really in your mind. Um, that's that's what they how they more define stress. But from a public health perspective, which is where I'm coming from, we define stress a little bit differently. Stress is anything that takes your body out of this, um, what we call homeostasis, right? Um, this well-being. So what is taking your entire body out of this well-being? And it can be known or unknown, perceived or not perceived. And it's not just from relationships. So really there are a number of these kind of building blocks that are major stressors in our life today. Um, and depending on where you live, um, they will be more or not more. But a big one for us where I live here over in San Bernardino County is um, environmental pollutants. So one of the stressors we face on a daily basis that's hidden and we don't know is even air pollution, okay? So air pollution is one of these things, <laughs> light pollution. If you have no way of really blocking out the light when you go to sleep or um, wherever you are, there's noise pollution, all kinds of environmental pollutants we face take a toll on their body. And there's a lot of research studies just looking at those and found they fact and found one research study found even people living near airports are at increased exposure to the noise from the planes taking off that it increases their risk of heart disease, right? And so we know environmental pollutants play a big role in um, stress in your body. Another one is your daily struggles, right? Most of us um, commuting is a big one. Thank heavens we have um, online so we don't have to travel a wide range uh, you know, to get to where we need to go. But we have these daily struggles with families and um, finances and around food, getting meals or commuting, um, or maybe it's in your job with your colleagues and things like that. These daily struggles also cause an immense, um, take an immense toll on our health. Then we have the unexpected or even the expected, the viruses and the bacteria. Right, we've been in this pandemic now, um, probably going on, you know, three three years, going on more, four year, going on our fourth year, right? So we've been in this pandemic, and um, we also have stressors that you know could take a toll on us um, from our childhood, and these are called adverse childhood experiences, things like divorce in the family, trauma, um, separation, incarceration, mental illness, any of those things um, can potentially have a lasting impact on us. And these things, while individually, they are harmful, they can cause stress in our body, and they work through a mechanism of promoting um, inflammation in our body. And I call this um, inflammation is the invisible dragon, right? So it's this um, inside your body, it's uh, associated with many different types of, of um, conditions, and it's not great. The challenging part is, these things can interact and magnify that negative impact, right? So if you're in an environmental pollutant area and you have a lot of daily struggles and the pandemic, they kind of come together and cause this negative synergy, which is not great, right? And so what is the price we pay when we are faced with all the stress and the associated inflammation that go with it? Well, guess what? All of the stress, it does take a toll. Our daily outcomes, you might be more prone to accidents, right? Or mistakes. Think about when you're driving somewhere and you are really stressed. You're more prone to make mistakes than if you're calm and relaxed and, and taking your time. There's increase in um, academic decline, right? And also burnout. Um, we're seeing this more and more, especially in light of the pandemic and the stress that has come from it. It also takes a toll on your immune system. It's linked with all kinds of chronic disease. 
from diabetes and how your immune system functions to these big ones that we face as we age from cancer, heart disease, stroke, um, insomnia. Guess what, guys? Insomnia is a huge, this sleep industry, $432 billion industry and expected to grow, okay? $432 billion. If you go into a Rite Aid or a drugstore and you look down the aisles, you're gonna see signs like above the aisle and they kind of give an indication of what are the conditions we really struggle with in our communities, right? And if you look, usually sleep is one big aisle by itself, right? $432 billion industry. Then we're looking at um, dementia and Alzheimer's, these mental, illness, mental, mental health challenges, mental conditions. And we're wondering how the COVID pandemic is gonna impact those and how can we offset that damage, right? Um, depression and even premature death. So we see all of these chronic diseases. And by the way, 90% of doctor's visits are stress related, right? So physicians and the medical industry, we're really good at getting the heart of these conditions. We, not the heart, but we wanna treat them. So we're good with medications. We're good if you need a procedure we're really bad at preventing them or delaying them, right? And so that's where my, my field of expertise is, how do we try to address delaying some of these? So no matter what age we live to, we can live um, longer and better. And also living, on, living with less stress, it also influences our relationships um, and our happiness. We're in a lot better place and then we can fulfill even our purpose in life. So, I really decided about um, 10 years ago, I wanted to figure out <clears throat> what is that buffer strategy? How do we address that stress in life? Whether it's from expected or unexpected things from daily living, how do we figure out how to handle that, right? And then live a longer, better life. And so back then I knew um, that insight to understanding how to handle stress probably comes from key communities in the world where people live longer and better, right? They have this increased resilience. And then also too, um, my faith tells me from the Bible reading, Job 12, 12, it says, wisdom is with the age, understanding and length of days. And so I think about where do I know where there's lots of older people, in fact, many centenarians. There's five regions in the world. They, I call them longevity, these longevity regions. Some call them blue zones. They've been called the fountain of youth. Five regions in the world, right? Okinawa, Japan, Ikaria, um, Greece, Sardinia, Italy, Nicoya, Costa Rica, and Loma Linda, California. Um, these were identified based on scientific research. Right? Researchers in these communities or studying these communities have published um, journal articles showing that indeed they do have an increased lifespan. So it's really backed by science that they have these. And, <clears throat> and they were identified on a cover of National Geographic. Hence, once this hit in 2005, people start flocking to these communities to find out what's the secret. So I live in Loma Linda, California, which is one of those longevity regions. And it is primarily um, an Adventist Christian community. So with uh, emphasis on um, more of a plant-based diet, eating um, less uh, meat, more plants and um, vegetables, fruits, um, increased exercising and moving, and a faith, you know, a faith-based community. And they have studies, I'm going to share a little bit later, um, one of the longest going lifestyle cohort studies is conducted by my university, um, looking at this population, and they published and found out, indeed, yes, there is less chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, cancer, COPD, and in fact, we do see compared to more of the general public, a delayed death, right? They, they tend to live longer. So I'm gonna talk about um, this a little bit later on, some specifics of that study. So <clears throat> 10 years ago when I was, um, I think I had even just ran through, um, I was late for a meeting. I, it was a meeting with the president of the university and some others, I was late, um, I was at the wrong office there's this huge lawn between um, many of the specialty buildings and where I thought the president was gonna meet. And I was late sitting there running late again, had my heels on and thought, 
Um, I'm going to run through the lawn to save time from going around on these paths. And lo and behold, as I started making my run through the lawn in heels, I didn't realize that the sprinklers had been turned on. So I am in mush and it's sinking and my black pants are getting dirty. And all of a sudden the strap of my shoes is broken because I'm stuck in the mud. I probably look like the swamp creature in some horror movie. And I'm sure the students walking nicely along the pathway um, were taking video of me somewhere and posting this. And so by the time I got to the meeting, um, I, I, I was, you know, beating, my forehead was beaded with stress and, and I had to um, slide my heels under the table and hope no one saw because um, I was really stressed. I had made bad decisions trying to get to this meeting. So I realized back then that this is not a sustainable way to be, right? I, I knew the biology that stress is linked to all of these chronic health conditions and inflammation is a big promoter of all of those chronic conditions. Um, I knew I'm in this longevity region. People are coming from around the world and wanna see what it takes. And I'm also a researcher and professor. So when all of this began to hit, I decided, you know what? I wanna do something not only for myself, but to also share with others that I find my other colleagues, my friends, um, my family, um, and anybody else I have met along the way. And since then, I've been going and sharing um, far and wide. So let me share you what, what I did. So I started out with qualitative research. And um, if any of you guys are in the research field, you'll know the qualitative is more interviews. Epidemiologists, we really tend to like the hard numbers. We want to survey with data. And so I had to convince my other colleagues that are also epidemiologists that this is going to be worthwhile. Um, we're going to go and interview them and see what we can find. So I set out. I wanted to learn about all the experiences, both positive and negative, how they handled stress, what was their lifestyle like, and I'm looking at the centenarians where I live. So I set out to find them. And I began finding them. This is Lydia. So I'm going to show you throughout this presentation many of the wonderful people I've met and the advice that they not only gave to me, but they are expecting me to share with you guys. Okay, this is Dr. Ellsworth Wareham. He is a heart surgeon. Um, he passed away just recently. He lived to 104, but he's a cardiac thoracic surgeon. Um, one of the groundbreaking pioneer surgeons doing heart surgery in Pakistan. He was the first. Before then, there was no one doing heart surgeries. So um, kings and presidents knew him and were even um, there to meet with him when he would arrive at the countries um, because he was one of these groundbreaking people do this. He worked well into his 90s, um, not necessarily performing surgery, but there in the hospital and helping. And we're going to share um, many his journey uh, to becoming a heart surgeon, and then um, even how he maintained um, mental clarity um, for so long. This is one of my favorites. Um, this is actually um, my husband's Chinese. This is my mother-in-law sitting here and, and her aunt and my one-year-old baby. This was my life at the time of, of doing this research. She was my first. Her name is Mulan Chai, and um, she passed away recently as well. She lived to 105, but here she is sitting in her home, right? She lived independently at a age 101. Here she is sitting and um, just amazing person. I would ask in the chat, but I don't know. I won't be able to see it. One of the questions I usually ask is, what is the chronic condition that you see she has? Okay. And usually people will wait a while. They're trying to figure out what the only chronic condition other than she did. We did. They did encourage her to walk with a cane there off to her right side. But her main chronic condition. Right. Eyes. So that was it. And when I asked her, um, we called her Mumu. What Mumu? Um, did you ever have any conditions that you had to deal with along the way? And she said, no. Nope. One time in her life, she had an ulcer, but that was, I think she had that for like a week or something. I don't, I don't know what happened, but she said one time she had an ulcer and that was it. And at a um, hundred, she was known to still be driving her car. She lived independently on Fridays. She would go to get her hair done 
And then on Saturday, she would head to church and drive herself. And she did have an accident where she fell down and in her garage. And then the family had decided it was time for her to give up her keys at 101. And she was a little miffed because she felt that if she was still driving, they wouldn't have to come and wait on her and she could get to her hairdresser on Friday and, and then to church and she could take care of herself. While we were there, at first I was very appalled to go and take my baby. I thought, this is not professional. Um, you know, in academia, sometimes we think children must be hidden. They have to see you as this one way professional that you are diehard, you're gonna do it all just perfectly. And so I didn't have a babysitter because I needed everybody to come and help me take pictures and interview. And so I brought her along. And needless to say, um, Mumu was so excited to see my daughter, Julia, here. She's one years old. And inside, it was really an aha moment for me, a switch of um, this worry of, of exceeding and climbing the ladder and becoming this wonderful professor in my life. And more, it became a focus of, connecting with family. Mumu even got down on the floor and was playing with Julie. I think she gave her gum to shake there or something like that. So it really right there was my first aha. Don't, you know, don't um, stay on the treadmill, get off and start enjoying the life and people around you. Okay. So when I went out and was asking all of these people, these centenarians I was meeting, um, many of them were in Loma Linda. That's where I started. Um, when I asked about where they were born, they come from all over the world. So their genetic background is from everywhere, from China to Japan to Argentina, Canada, US, Mexico, everywhere. And one of the questions I asked them was, can you tell me about hard times in your life or um, yeah, a hard challenge in your life that you've had to overcome? And the centenarians would tell me, we had no hardships. And so I would think maybe they don't understand the question. Let me rephrase. Um, were there any, um, you know, instead of hardships, I would call it um, difficulties or some other way, like something that was very painful or something. And many of them would say to me again, no, no, you know, we didn't have any. So finally, I just said, well, let me listen to you share about your life. Can you describe your childhood and then on up to adult? And when they began describing their life, that was where I kind of fell off my chair and realized they had tremendous hardship. They had tremendous stressors. In fact, the centenarians I interviewed, majority of them lived in poverty or they were very poor. Um, <clears throat> they were experienced um, you know, physical and emotional neglect um, in the family. Some of them had that. Food scarcity was a big one. One, um, it wasn't later Salma, they later realized um, in life when she was at the dental school and they were checking her teeth, they asked her, did you have rickets as a child? And she didn't know, but she probably had it. They didn't have enough food. Um, there was no money even for milk, hardly anything. In fact, Salma's job every day was to take a nickel and this huge coffee can and go, she didn't even own shoes, she went barefoot up the road, I think they lived in Kansas, and they go to the back of this dairy and ask for skim milk to fill this coffee can. And that was to feed, um, she had a large, there was seven kids in that family and the dad was relatively um, absent. So that was what they had to feed the family, very little. And um, later on, they found out she had rickets. Um, many of them had a loss of some parent or a sibling. They had family separation to the war and poverty. There was household mental illness, addictions, abuse, witness to violence, and they experienced these stress as adults too. Not to mention the pandemics that they went through. Not only the Spanish flu in 1918, but in 1957 and 68, they went through more um, influenza, these massive pandemics. So they've been through um, not only those, but then more even in recent years. And now, uh, many had gone through, um, you know, um, the COVID pandemic. So then I began asking them about the, the um, sharing about activities and things in their life. And if you have a camera, I recommend you take a picture of the slide because right here, you guys, this is the secret sauce for um, living longer 
but living more resiliently and living better. It's right here. Okay, so when I asked, recorded, I took back my took back my interviews, um, painstakingly transcribed them word for word, and then I would analyze the these transcriptions looking for themes. Okay, so among the centenaries, these eight came out. The very first one, I call it a keystone habit. Keystone habit means one habit that influences many other habits in your life. And for them, it was nature engagement. These guys were primarily farmers, right? From sun up to sundown. In fact, Dr. Ellsworth Wareham, when he would raise in the morning, his family owned dairy cows, he'd get up at four in the morning. He had to go to not only milk the cows and there was no um, electricity, no good machinery at that time. So he had to do by hand, by manpower, collect the cows, do that, then go back in the house, quickly eat breakfast and then walk an hour to get to school. So that was really his life. And many of the centenarians, this is the life that they had. Um, they didn't have vehicles. So their primary mode of transportation was walking. So these first two nature engagement and kinetic life really go together. Their life was active and moving and outdoors. The next one is resting reset. Because they were farmers, their time of day of raising and going to bed was really tied with the setting and rising of the sun. Um, in fact, they didn't have electricity. Uh, Nita Mackey said, and I'll share about her a little later, she's 105 centenarian, but she said as a child, they were shooed off to bed by seven, seven, eight, um, because it was really tied to the daylight. And then it was the same even on the weekend. Simple foods, they were so poor that the foods that they had to eat was really what they had grown in their yard um, from fruits and vegetables. Um, if they had bread, they would have to make it um, very simple foods, no food on the fly because there was no fast food, no nothing. It was really with family and friends and sit down. And the drink of choice was the only choice. It was really just water. Okay. Um, sometimes if they had money, skim milk, something else, but really back Mulan Chai asked her, what is your favorite thing to drink? I said, do you like tea? She said, no, really just water. So another one that they shared together was this faith foundation. These guys really came together and they weren't as young um, and across, some of them across their entire lifespan, they weren't necessarily Adventists, but they did have a faith in God and they really were connected to churches um, to help one another, um, to gain support, especially in times of crisis. In fact, when the Great Depression hit, um, one of them remembers that that was where they went for support was the church to find answers, to find support in a better way to help one another. It was really through the church. Family and friends camaraderie, basically they worked together and they helped one another. Okay. And that was who they had to rely on tremendously. Um, in fact, like every evening, the meals were sit down at home and, and together helping hands. Um, it goes without saying they supported one another. In fact, one of the things you're going to see is the overlapping nature of many of these principles. In fact, I encourage, don't look at them as a number like eight to be achieved, but rather they are overlapping. And um, hopeful intrinsic drive means they were hopeful for their self. It wasn't necessarily always happy or pleasant, but they believed that the choices they were making was going to help to fuel um, a better way for them. So, and science has shown each one of these has a health benefit in some way, some shape or form, there's health benefits. Okay, and so I say, if you have a hard time remembering all eight, one of the ways you can remember is to live active, which is kinetic and nature engagement, balanced, resting, reset, and simple foods, um, connected is with that family and friends camaraderie and the faith foundation and determine that hopeful drive. You're helping yourself and you're helping others. So active balance, connected, determined. And this is, was the philosophy and how they lived every day, right? And all of those things really cover your whole being, your mind, body, spirit. So every one of those um, has some way, shape, or form tied to the well-being of the whole person. So um, before we go on to see some more numbers, I want to share with you guys some study findings. I want to show you some 
interesting pictures. So these guys, here's uh, Rudolfo, 100 years old. If you look at them, you might think they're in their 80s, um, but these guys are over 100. And the paradox to consider is here they are. They had many stressors. These guys had many ACEs or adverse childhood experiences, meaning that should have limited their lifespan. And here they are, here's Rodolfo, he's smiling, he's helping. Um, and they have this resilient long life. So this is the first. This is Lydia, here she is. Um, Lydia is a centenarian, another one, um, really vibrant personality. She is knitting NICU hats or um, hats for newborns at Loma Linda Med Center, and she knits about two a day. So I heard from your professor that there's even offered courses there at Saddleback. Maybe you can take for free even knitting classes. If you're looking for a way to get involved and help, um, you can follow in the footsteps of Lydia and even take up that to donate for um, NICU babies or newborns. So one of the concepts to consider is, okay, these guys as a whole, when you look at them, they are a genetically diverse group, right? So it's likely it's not so much in the genes as it is a signal to the strength in the lifestyle factors, those eight, my secret sauce, right? Um, that can influence delaying aging, improving your health and well-being. And if you wanna live to 100, which some may wanna live to 100, it stacks the deck in your favor, right? These guys were low income. So science tells us um, that actually low income is more of a hindrance to, to aging well. But these guys are um, the, they go against the grain. And the same thing with two of the other communities, um, Nikoya and Okinawa in Japan. Okinawa in Japan is actually one of the lowest um, income communities compared to the rest, and yet they have the best survival rates within their country. So same thing here um, with our centenarians that we saw. So somehow their lifestyle and working together and what they're doing is able to offset uh, much of the stressors they faced. Okay, and when speaking of stressors, okay, so these guys, extreme poverty, mental illness, family separation, all of these are what they consider adverse childhood experiences or like stress. And it didn't just happen in their childhood. It was across their lifespan. And we know from science that if they have six or more, well, even, even three or four of these different um, exposures, these different ACEs, it leads to greater risk of having a chronic condition. Um, when they have six of these different categories, it shortens their lifespan by 20 years. So the centenarians, they all had a minimum A score of four, and even a few of them had a, a score of six. So rather than living to 105, they would have, it would have said they should have lived 20 years younger. But um, the lifestyle is likely what affords them protection from the stress of experiencing these things. And here's a picture of the 1918 Spanish flu. And kind of looks like today, except um, in Southern California, I don't think we own any coats. In fact, I was joking with your professor this morning. I was actually cold. I thought about buying a coat today. Um, but this is what it looked like back in 1918, right? And it's unpredictable. And one of the things to better weathering what's thrown our way is in um, your lifestyle and picking in things that actually influence uh, better outcomes. There is a study that's published looking at more of a plant-based diet and COVID outcomes. And the study is among healthcare workers. And indeed, they found that those that ate more of a plant-based diet had a reduced likelihood of having um, more, not only um, a, a poor outcomes after COVID exposure, um, less severity, they had less severe COVID, and they were more likely to survive than those that um, were less likely to be vegetarian. So um, I am not a vegetarian after doing this, I have to confess, but after doing this um, journey of meeting centenarians, it has helped me to begin to shift towards um, a better way because I realized, ah, their habits protects them for the unexpected and helps them actually to find uh, more of a peaceful, peaceful um, and happy journey.
This is Dr. Ellsworth Worm here in his scrubs. Um, these veterinarians, most were health professionals. They ended up in life uh, working in the healthcare field. But if you would have seen them in childhood, you would have never guessed. So Ellsworth Worm came from a family. They, I, he was born, I believe, in Texas, but they ended up um, in Canada, uh, dairy farmers. His family didn't have much money. And one day he was walking along and decided, I'm going to be a physician. And he told his family and they said, but we have no money. And he just had this passion, this dream and said, you know, I'm going to make it. I feel like this is my calling in life and where I'm going to be. Right. So he had a major challenge, but he was able to overcome. Another one I'm going to show you is Dr. Mildred Stilson. She is one of seven female in her school, a medical, medical school class here at Loma Linda. And um, just a wonderful, went on to overcome barriers. Women didn't practice medicine at that time. And so you can imagine what she went through. Another I'm gonna show you is Anita Mackey. She was born here in Riverside. She's African-American. And um, she lived near predominantly all, all, um, all Caucasian community. And she had to endure quite a bit. Um, and, and her mindset is amazing and it helped Many of these challenges helped them for what they were gonna be set up doing later in life. They had limited to no resources and yet these guys were trailblazers. They had a mindset of, I am going to go and help. So one of the things I want you to ponder and to think about it is the possibility that when you go through these hardships and some of these were tremendous, I mean, the loss of parents and the loss of siblings is um, you know, so painful. Um, but they went through these hardships and they actually came out better um, equipped than when they actually faced the initial um, hardship. And they didn't get, they didn't, they were able to shift their mindset and not, um, that wasn't the focus of their life. So um, in the Bible, Philippians 3.13 says, letting go, it's about letting go of yesterday's mistakes and pressing on to tomorrow. And I can't tell you how much when I look at the centenarians and I ask them about their hardship, they weren't focused on that. They were already going on and making a difference in others' lives, right? So their focus was shifted. And it reminds me of this bowl. I don't know if you guys have um, art class and you can make this there. If you do, I really encourage it. Maybe you can send me one. Um, this is called Kintsugi and it's a Japanese bowl and it's the art of golden joinery. So they take this bowl and it's broken and they rejoin it, um, all the cracks and the jagged pieces with gold, right? And the more they have to use the gold, the more expensive the bowl becomes. And it makes me think of the centenarians and their hardships in life, right? And so when I heard their stories and I look back and I see them today, I realize how those hardships open the door and set them up for who they're going to become. And it was really um, such an eye-awakening experience and um, not something to be hidden, but something that, you know, is a part of them and really made them who they are today. And it's, they're these beautiful people. Here's Anita Mackey. If I had the chat, I'd ask you to guess her age. And um, she's African-American. She lives in a retirement community. She's what you call a super centenarian. So this is Anita Mackey. And she was, I asked her, you know, early on, she said no hardships. But then when she shared about her life, at nine years of age, her mom passed away. And it was very traumatic. Her dad raised her and her siblings. And they were prepared. Every day before um, her mom passed away in childbirth, so not only the baby that was born died, but the mom died as well. And Anita was sharing with me that they went to the funeral and they were there, both were buried at the same. Very hard. And she said, but her mom had raised her well. They were part already helping and, and cooking and taking care of the families together. They all were involved even before their mom suddenly passed away. So she said that preparation in life really prepared her for that. And then um, at the meal times. So at meal times, they would all gather in the evening, and the dad would ask every one of them to go around the table and share what happened today, how did you handle it, is there anything we should do differently, and what are what are the blessings that you experienced today? And Anita said, um, I think that was a part of 
her parents were the last children of slaves. And so part of that growing up to protect the family was to ask at the end of the day, how the day went and what should they do and how do they handle it differently? And so um, Anita said, living that way, asking every day what happened, how, how did you handle it? Is there anything they should do differently? And any blessings helped her to come with this no regrets at the end of her life. So she really said she has no regrets. And she is a social medical worker at the VA. And she really instilled this in her um, veterans that she would take care of at the VA, asking them, you know, are there things that you did? How can you handle it? Um, when should you get started making changes and things like that? And interesting enough, I think Anita could see that even going to her meeting, I, I was driving like a madman to Glendale. She lives over in Glendale now. Um, and she could tell I look stressed. And she was already asking me um, uh, how to handle things different in my life. So we had a very wonderful meeting. And, and then after that, it was time to go and share with others. After I saw all these guys, I realized they are a community of resilience. This is how you live differently, right? Um, they shouldn't have lived to 100, and they shouldn't be doing all the independent things that they were doing. So I called them a resiliency capital. And one of the things about all of those eight habits is that I'm beginning to see from the literature, they have this um, positive synergy effect. If you think back to the slide I showed you of the stressors, one of the things about those stressors is when they come together, they have a synergy effect where they work together in a bad way. Well, these guys in these habits work to offset that damage in a good way. And it's that synergy effect. Most often we pick and choose one of these and we'll really do that well, but we forget the rest of them. And the benefit is lost because the, Ease is in the overlap and the power is in the synergy. Let me say that again. So when you practice these in an overlapping manner, it makes them easier to practice. And the protection comes because these things even magnify the benefit when they interact. So I say the ease is in the overlap and the power in the protection is in the synergy, okay? And so they have studies now coming out that these guys really dampen that inflammation that comes from stress in the body. And one of the ways they which is called inflammaging, right there, you can see it spelled out. It's this process where as we age, inflammation increases in our body in general, but then we have factors that might promote that. And that is those that inflammation in the body is what begins to be linked with um, disease and 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 actually promotes um, early death, right? So if we're able to reverse that effect, it slows the aging process. Okay, and scientists know now we think that stress embeds itself in your body through inflammation. So if you were to look at that in your body and you don't have to understand all of these. This is kind of the mechanism for the scientists in the group. So stress, or here is even ACEs, it works to increase inflammation and then telomere length. These guys are the little caps on the end of your chromosome, okay? You mean the greater the length of these telomeres, the more protected, right? And protection is good for the chromosome because then it can function longer. With each cell dividing, they shorten the telomeres a little bit. And if you have stress, it increases that shortening of that telomere length. And eventually, if the telomere length is gone, the cell will stop dividing. And that's, you know, shortened telomere length is linked to um, decreased lifespan, right? And so stress promotes shortening of that telomere. However, all of those habits that I'm talking about, and we even started looking at um, even diet, uh, plant-based diet, they're finding that it actually is linked to lengthening of your telomere length. So it's a good thing. Air pollution, we're finding that is one of those stressors that we may face. Um, it increases inflammation and linked to shortening telomere length. But if you think of the centenarians, these guys lived here through a lot of time when there's a lot of more pollution in our region down here. And here they made it to 100 and you saw um, Mulan Chai with you know, no adverse outcomes, right? They really were to able to offset the damage that may come from living in a stressful environment. In a nutshell, so what we say in a nutshell, 
they live stressful lives um, and they practice these eight resilient factors across their lifespan. Each of those factors has in itself is able to dampen inflammation. And we know that inflammation as it increases is linked with morbidity and mortality. So this really is their hidden secret sauce um, for living to 100. And they have advice for us, right? So their advice is to help us, how do we weather the unexpected? Things are unexpected in life is gonna happen. How do we get prepared for that? How do we fight a range of chronic stressors? I mean, rather than going one by one and finding, okay, I have high cholesterol, I have, I, you know, I have a family history of um, mental illness, right? Um, as they age, dementia, how do I fight that? Um, rather than with uh, medication, is there a way it can offset my risk of developing? And there is, that's what the centenarians are showing us, right? And then, and then it also helps you open doors of opportunity. So before we look at some more evidence, I want to show you guys, um, I want to take a minute, and this was in the handout, okay? So this is your resiliency wheel. I'm going to move you guys over here for a moment. So this is the resiliency wheel, and I created this to think about what are your strengths and what might be your weaknesses as you compare your lifestyle to that lived 100 years ago, right? And you don't have to show this to anybody. This isn't a test and there's no grading, but it gives you an idea. So here are the eight factors. And what I recommend is you're going to draw a line. So across that piece of the pie, 10 is the best and one is, you know, a lot more work needed. I never say bad. I just say room for improvement, a lot of room for improvement. Okay. 10 is the best. So if you go here, how often are you outdoors in nature? You draw a line across. Then you'll go to how physically active you are. What's your diet like? Is it fruits and vegetables? And even, even I put, is it on the fly? That was me. I was eating fruits and vegetables a lot of times, but it might be on the fly, um, which is not great. How much sleep do you get? Your friends connection and your family connection. You think about that. These are two different ones. Um, your faith connection. Do you have a faith or go somewhere to church? Your positive mindset. How do you think that? And then your helping hand. Do you, um, and it doesn't have to be an all-encompassing volunteering. It may even be thinking of looking around, around you in your class or wherever who you help. So as you draw your line across these things, and then you look. When I first did this, a lot of my things were a five or less, right? And really short. And so when you're done doing this, you stand back and you look and you see the the best wheel is the one where it's the most efficient, right? You're out near the tens and it's very round. Most people won't have that because, well, you know, life happens and we have, you know, strengths and weaknesses. And so the goal is really to um, use your strengths, what you're good at to help you shore up your weaknesses. So for me, time in nature was a good one. Um, my food was the bad one. So I really use um, my time in nature to help me shore up in ways my weaknesses and my rest was probably not so good. So I took more breaks out in nature doing things um, and rest is not only your sleep at night, quality and quantity, um, but also your breaks throughout the day. We're not made to go long hours of, you know, um, these work and intense and there's no breaks. Um, it's a very, it's a very difficult life or multitasking. It's very difficult um, um, to, to sustain these kind of things. So you look at your wheel and you just think, is it a very efficient wheel with a large wheel? Or is it a very small wheel that you have to work very fast? Is it a very bumpy ride? So you can imagine your own resiliency wheel and that will kind of give you an idea of things that you can work on. And probably many of you guys have started your new year's resolution. So maybe you can add these. And one of the things I want to remind you guys is, you know, when you make changes, it's a journey. It's not black and white and we don't beat ourselves up. I am the first person to tell you, and this is my disclaimer for the next data I'm going to show you. I am not vegetarian. I do eat meat and sometimes red meat. I like a steak. And, um, you know, sometimes much to my colleagues, you know, they might cringe if they heard me. 
I will take my young children through McDonald's to enjoy a happy meal or the nuggets or whatever, you know, but rather than having that be the norm, like it used to be, it's now like more of a um, special time and, you know, a treat, right? So I have begun shifting my life to become more in balance versus um, very hectic, very fast paced and not a sustainable way of being. And let me tell you, some of the people who I know that have the most hectic lifestyle are actually some retired people. Their schedules become very full. And we're going to talk about that um, in your, in your uh, homework. Before then, I want to talk to you guys about this lifestyle cohort study. The Adventist Health Study is done by my university. It's colleagues of mine are involved with this, but um, we all share about the data and know things. So this started back in 1958. They began wanting to know um, if the lifestyle is really linked with um, pretty much it was cancer and heart disease, but now they've advanced to um, Alzheimer's and dementia and things like that. And so it started way back then and has expanded and has been going on ever since. It's this humongous um, lifestyle cohort where they answer a survey booklet that takes you all. Oh, it's it takes. I made my husband enroll, and it took. It takes about forty five minutes to complete the survey because it's very detailed of your dietary patterns, what you eat, how you exercise, how you sleep. So they've been publishing on this ever since, and. It's one of the few longest um, studies in the world looking at that. If you want to find more information, um, you can go online. They have a bibliography on their website. You can look up all their studies and, and see what they've done. Um, it's tremendous amount. So in, in 2005, um, National Geographic, this is where we got thrown into the spotlight. National Geographic um, basically came out with this um, uh this this book you know their magazine came out and and is the about all of the longevity capitals right and so we are one of those in the melinda dr frazier is one of the pis he is the lead pi on the Adventist health study and years ago he also had written a book called diet life expectancy and chronic disease and it shares uh, many of the study findings at that time since then we've even expanded but because of this cover, many people came and wanted to know what his secrets. Okay, so I'm gonna share with you guys a little bit of the data for my scientists, people that wanna see, and I will work to make it um, more understandable. So this is, let me see if I can see, this is the percentage of people surviving to a certain age, 65 and 85 for males, 65 and 85 for females. And usually Japan, that's known for their longevity. So this, this table is published in um, Dr. Frazier's book. But Japan, the percentage of, of surviving, 80% are going to survive to the 65 and then um, less at age you know, 85. Same thing for females. However, he began comparing the overall US. And then he began comparing California Adventists and even among the Adventists, the vegetarians. So they really looked to see. And I'm gonna show you here in a moment. So these guys were even better than what he was seeing in Japan. So he began looking even, a big part of the study was comparing the Adventists and whether or not they were more, and even among the Adventists, there's a wide range of those that might be more plant-based versus um, more meat-based. Um, and they compared that to California. And indeed he found um, there is increased life expectancy um, so that it's almost to 10 years okay so when he compares um, the best um, most uh, the, the, the we call them the best behaved Adventists um, there's almost 10 years increase in life expectancy um, compared to um, just the general public right and a lot of it has to do with these few habits that they did so he found regular exercise eating more plant-based diet. And they do do a lot of studies with eating a small amounts of nuts, maintaining normal body weight. And a big one is not smoking or um, eliminating smoking, right? And so it was those habits um, which were linked with really improving and significantly reducing the likelihood of disease and early death. And so when we look at um, the percentage of people dying from these different diseases, this was California compared to the Adventist Health Study. 
And Dr. Frazier looked and said, let's see what percentage of people die from heart disease among California. He'd find ah, 39% compared to 40% among the Adventists. So it's pretty similar. And then he'd look at cancer, 23% among Cal Californians and 19% among Adventists. So still fairly similar. Stroke, 6% among Californians, 8% among Adventists, and on and on. So he began saying, hey, we die of the similar things, right? Heart disease, cancer, stroke. But then when he would compare the ages, okay? Heart disease, died 75 years of age compared to 80, almost 83 for Adventists. Um, cancer, 71 is the average age. Um, for Californians, 77, almost 78 for Adventists. Um, stroke, 79 for um, Californians almost 86 for Adventists. So he began realizing this pattern of, we die of the similar things, it's just that at a later date, right? It's delaying death. So within this study, they'll look at different dietary factors. And here's one looking at nut consumption and, and coronary heart disease, which is um, your plaques and your arteries and things like that. And so he looked at, let's see if you increase your nut consumption, how that affects your risk of having either a non-fatal or a fatal heart attack. MI is heart attack, it means myocardial infarction. And indeed he finds you're decreasing risk with increasing nut consumption. So even nuts one to four times a week, if you eat it, and this was total nuts, any type of nuts, um, greatly and significantly improves and reduces your risk of heart attack, okay? Then he looks at men and women. Let's see if it's different for men and women. Women, we still do see a significant improvement, though not as strong as what we see for men reducing the heart disease, the more nuts you eat. Then he said, let's see if, if it's just for young, you know, people under 80 or people over 80. And he found similar, right? Eating and consuming nuts at least once a week significantly reduced the risk of heart disease. So they said, let's look at exercise. Okay, so, and your risk of a like heart attack, fatal CHD, right? And depending on your exercise compared to those who just do low, medium to higher amount of exercise was linked with your decreasing risk, which is something that we all kind of know. And keep in mind the centenarians, their level of exercise um, was active movement every day. One of my colleagues, um, Dr. Jackie Chan, she decided back in 2002, she, or a little before, she was going to study water. And at that time, no one really cared because they thought if water is free, how is it so great, right? And so she said, well, let me look at the risk of uh, a heart attack of water consumption in males. And each one of these figures, you can just look at one of them, the first one, it's just she's adding different things she adjusts for in her model to see if it still holds. And basically what she found is indeed for males, you cut your risk in almost half by consuming at least three, if not five glasses of water a day. And she said one of the things about reducing your risk of a heart attack, um, she found that even early in the morning, you're at greatest risk um, because you're really dehydrated. And she said, um, one of the first things to do is reach for a glass of water. And if you remember the centenarians, their choice of drink was really only water. And for female, she's found a similar, um, not as strong, but still cutting the risk um, significantly by drinking more water. Then she said, I wanna look among people who have normal blood pressure or normal tensive and compared with people who are high blood pressure. And she found for both groups, um, water consumption does reduce your risk of a fatal heart attack. So then she said, um, let me look among those that eat meat compared to those who don't even eat meat. Um, same thing, similar. So she's looking across all of these groups and finding water significantly reduces. Then she flipped the question and said, let me see if it's tea. If, if you drink other things other than water, does it improve your risk? And no, actually goes the other way. Increasing fluids other than water, it actually increased your risk um, of having a fatal heart attack. Same thing for women. 
Next, one of the things they look at is the effect of, of meat in your diet. And let me just say for the record, I am not primarily a vegetarian. So after studying the centenarians, I do try to eat more plant-based and encourage my kids, but it's been a journey and um, you know, we're enjoying it. But if you look at, this is meat consumption and cancer, okay? Anything where it's above one, like 1 1.5, it means there's a 50% increased risk. Um, though you have to look to see if this p-value is significant and less than 0 0.05 means significant. So colon, eating more um, meat, and this is total meat, increases your risk of colon cancer by 85%, right? So I take this and look at and think bladder, down here is bladder, um, more than once a week, it does increase your risk over 138% um, for bladder cancer. Um, ovary two, we see a significant increase here. Well, if we look at that same um, data, but kind of in a figure here, it becomes kind of apparent that you see there is an increasing risk, especially for um, ovary and for colon, right? And then this is looking at colon again. We look at, um, we see that when we do not include the value of one, that means this is significant. So there's an 85% increased risk of colon cancer with eating total meat um, more than once a week. Granted, there are other types of meat like um, fish and things like that that are, are protective, but this was just looking at total meat. And if we look at other um, diseases, diabetes, okay, so anybody worried about diabetes, um, among the Adventists, when they compare the vegetarian to semi-vegetarian to non-vegetarian, they do see for both, especially for men, um, the non-vegetarian compared to vegetarian is an increased risk for diabetes. So they're really moving away from eating more of the plant-based to um, more of the meat-based diets. And we do see um, an increased risk. Okay, so anybody worried about arthritis? Um, or, you know, um, things like that. So for arthritis, we do see meat intake is linked, um, even those eating once a week, um, compared to those eating more than once a week, there is an increased risk of, of um, rheumatoid arthritis. And one of the things about eating like red meat is it is linked with a higher um, inflammatory value in your body. It's linked with um, this protein called CRP, C-reactive protein. So, which is linked with a lot of those chronic conditions. Um, this one, I believe is, uh, I can't really see this one. Let's see, we'll go to the next one. So when we look at some selective risk factors, this one is looking at the need for hypertension medication according to vegetarian status. And they see that indeed, as they're moving away from more of a plant-based to more of a meat-based diet, um, there is an increased risk of needing blood pressure medication for hypertension. This is looking at fruits and cancers. So hopefully um, many of us are like fruit and eat fruit. That seems to be a um, more of one that we'll pick and go to versus vegetables, but fruit also has a protective factor. Um, and so anything where you're less than one, means it's protective. If your relative risk is greater than one or at one means no association, greater than one means it's a risk. So some of these, it's not until we um, have uh, like greater than two a day, we see a decreased risk, though it's not significant. Um, for pancreas though, raisins, dates, and dried fruit greater than three times a week was associated with significant protect protection. Um, for pancreatic cancer, right? And I think that was the uh, only really strong one here that we see among fruit. Tomatoes, um, when we look at cancer of prostate, we do see um, protection, right? Especially for ovary cancer, ovary cancer um, for, for women. Okay, so tomato frequency. Some psychosocial and other um, uh, uh, their variables looking at coronary heart disease. This is just a few last pieces of data I wanna show with you guys. Exercising. So exercising reduces the risk of coronary heart disease, right? 
And um, they did see that with nut consumption. Nuts are a great source of fiber. They're also um, rich in vitamin E, which is an anti-inflammatory. So nuts are a great source. Some feeding trial studies have found uh, nuts lower um, LDL cholesterol, right? And then the last one down here, they even looked at um, church attendance, heading to church. So um, those that attend less than once a month, significantly greater risk of coronary heart disease than those that are attending more. And then this table is looking at not just heart attacks, but any cause of death, right? And so they indeed find similar things here where we're looking at um, meat consumption greater than once a week was increasing the risk of um, mortality. Same thing with um, exercise was the reverse protection. Same thing with nuts. Again, these stars mean significant. Um, smoking, right? Of course, smoking is a risk factor, but um, you know, better to stop than not to stop. And church attendance, for those going less than uh, once a month, we do see an increased risk of heart disease, or uh, this one is all-cause mortality. So what do we know from all of these things? Well, when they look at the data as a group, um, they see among this, that practice this kind of lifestyle, um, much lower risk of CHD, especially um, um, below the age of 70, they have found that there's greater um, risk of, uh, less risk of disease. And what I see from the data was the findings really support the practices that I've seen among the centenarians. So really interesting. Um, even with the nuts, we had one, uh, one centenarian that that was their job was even shelling pistachios to help raise money. Uh, they lived in the Midwest. And so um, generating a lot of their income, they would shell um, nuts. Okay, so after I was done um, interviewing them, this is Salma. She uh, was 103 here when I'm interviewing her and she gave me a potholder. Um, it was this potholder kind of cleaner thing to go and clean up my kitchen and get busy um, cleaning up my life, basically living a healthier lifestyle. And she told me, you're going to go and help others. Salma is the one that they thought she had rickets. She walked barefoot to get the milk. And um, it was really hard for her growing up. Her family was able to scrape together money and to be able to send her to school. She went to some college even, which back then was amazing. She ended up becoming a teacher in a one-room schoolhouse and um, her hardships helped her to endure um, hardships in the community where she was working because the school was notorious for some unruly kids, but Selma was able to handle and the parents were so overjoyed to have her. But a lot of her hardships helped set her up. So she said, go and teach them, okay? So this is kind of where the rubber meets the road and I'm gonna show you guys some ways that you can embed this in your life, right? And it starts with a desire and seeing how to change your pace and readjusting your focus, right? From not just, you know, um, survive each day, but how do you um, live a more abundant life? Okay, so one of the things I recommend and I do, I have this green ribbon. So I wear this and I'll show you guys. I always tie on something green to remind me this mine that says everyday resilience. So it reminds me every day the choices I'm making, and I think we make about 25,000 choices each day, is to try to make some of those more consciously rather than just allowing um, the day to influence the choices that I make. You can also make a vision board um, to help you connect with your desire to change. This is just a cork board you can get anywhere and or just pin up some um, uh, posters or printouts of things that you would like to change in your life. And this helps you keep track and to stay focused. So positive influence in your life. This is like planting a seed. And you have to remember your thoughts influence your actions, your actions influence your behavior, and the behavior influences um, who you'll become. And that is true whether it's early in life or late in life. So your schedule, this is where we start, you guys. And if your schedule looks like this, not to worry, this is my schedule. Busy, 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 every day, even on the weekends. So I had to sit for half a day and I recommend sitting to evaluate what does your schedules look like? And some of the busiest people are actually retired people I know. 
So are you happy with your schedule? Is this a sustainable life you have to, you want to ask yourself, right? And are you living, what are your priorities, right? Your priorities are the things that you're doing the most. What is your motivation? For me, a while back, it was to climb the, you know, the professor ladder, right? And to move up. And then I realized, you know, um, working so hard and sacrificing so much of my other life was not something I wanted to do. So I realized um, my motivation had shifted. Now my motivation is take what I've learned from my centenarian friends and help others to do the same. If you are on committees where there's not bearing any good fruit, if your committees are mainly meeting and talking about, you know, the color of paint on a door or something like that, it's time to start weeding off some of those meetings. Um, some of us will have to let go of control. We may um, be making our schedule so busy because um, we want to be involved and control a lot of things. And, and that's not healthy either because your schedule is like your time closet. You only have 24 hours in a day. Right. And so you have to really evaluate what you have and how you're spending that. Does your schedule include resiliency? And is there any white space on your schedule? Some of the best memories come when you appreciate that white space. Okay, this is Dr. Mildred's son. She was the one of seven in med school. She trained and became a physician, a pathologist actually, and then became um she was a missionary in Africa, um, helping to take care of families over there. In fact, her and her husband would do surgeries together. Sometimes she'd be the only one in the ER and in would walk a patient that needed a surgery. And it would be her and her daughter right there taking care of someone and they'd have to do it. And so she reminds me Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. Look carefully then how you walk, live purposefully and worthily and accurately, not as the unwise, but as wise, right? And making the most of every time or the very time you have. So that's her advice, right? Is really thinking of your schedules and do you use your time wisely? One of the ways you're gonna find out is you journal about your life. Sit and take about a half a day, I recommend, um, to go over what your journal looks like. And you can do this just for a week journal, write down your daily habits, what you eat. Um, you might also write about what you spend on I included a handout on financial resilience. You guys might like to um, take a look, especially in the time where gas prices are going through the roof, right? Um, so this is some tips of how do we shore up um, some of our finances. Word of caution, the world around us is gonna want to increase speed. It works through fear, distress, and disease, and it robs you of your ability to live your life. So remember the world thrives on convenience, automation, rush, business and excess. So I want you to think of ways that you can dial that back and try a more slow and steady pace. This is Holy Crooks. She is known for her mountaineering lifestyle. She holds the record um, for hiking the highest mountain here in the US, Mount Whitney, and the highest in um, Japan, Mount Fuji, at the oldest age. She summited those in her early 90s. So she would always take people along with her, encourage them, right? And so I want you to slow your pace so that you can run the right race and take others with you. And even some of the people who you wanna encourage are some of the least likely that you think need encouragement, right? Be aware of what's around us. Um, and I also recommend use nature. Nature isn't in a hurry. It helps with healing. Right, And there is a rhythm for resilient life in a slower and steady pace and it's lived every day, not just on the weekends. So plan your calendars, carve out your time, purposely disconnect from the pace and the noise. A big stealer of your peace is rushing, right? So you have to say no so that you can say yes. So here is those four cornerstones. And I say, we're gonna practice we looked at the journaling and now you wanna go on and move into even being active. No a la carte health. Okay, a la carte is where we pick and choose. Right now, the biggest things people choose is diet. That's number one. Maybe um, sleep is another one they fight for, but you really wanna have that balance in all of them because that is how you get the best benefit, not by picking only one. 
Oh, here we go. Live more like they did a hundred years ago. Think about how you're gonna embed movement in your everyday life. And my friends, it's not just cardio. If you think about the pots and the pans that they used for cooking, they weighed a ton, even just making and picking up pots and pans, right? So think about how can you add nature into your life from walking to people, um, taking, taking um, and making errands that are walking, parking farther away if you drive to a store, right? If you're in a stressful environment, do you have a window nearby that you can even look out? Or even planning hiking events like Holder Crooks. Um, in fact, we have a park here in Loma Linda that's named for her. And set measurable goals on your calendar market. And in this class, one of the things I wanna challenge you guys is to get an accountability partner. Maybe someone from this class, you can pair up and think about how are we gonna start and embedding being active and outdoors in our life more, right? And go, use this class more than, you know, to come, it's great knowledge, but um, wisdom only gets you so far, you have to apply it, right? And so I wanna encourage you guys um, this year, how are you gonna change some of these? This is Dr. Ellsworth Wareham. He is mowing his own yard here at 100, okay? So the things that we, um, that we don't have time for, this is what I say. The things that you don't have time for in life are often the things that extend your lifetime and make it even better, right? So here he is at 100. It's very physical tasking work, takes time. He's out, he's mowing his yard. And he's a heart surgeon, hey, he was. And uh, here he is, he's still practicing medicine and, and mowing his yard. And you have to do this. You can't just wait until the weekend. There is no catch up. It's gotta be over the week as well. In nature, okay? So someone asked me in uh, one of my, I presented to physicians a while back and they asked me, okay, so how soon do you get the benefit of even being outdoors? Well, they have studies even in 10 minutes when they swab or cortisol in the mouth of some people who went outdoors 10 minutes, their stress level drops, that cortisol level drops 10 minutes. So even as little as 10 minutes, but um, you know, doing more is even, is even better, helps um, improve sleep, enhance work. Um, they do have studies showing lower hospital rates for dementia and other um, mental health conditions. It's gonna help you age gracefully. And less infections, less common cold. By the way, they have a study. You don't even have to, you know, it's better if you're in nature, but they have a study of patients in the hospital. Patients who after surgery, if their room viewed nature, they got discharged significantly sooner than if their room didn't have a view, right? So um, out in nature, even seeing it can help. This is Holy Crooks. She started, she didn't start in her earlies. She started 65 years of age, deciding to start hiking and taking others. And Congress, um, they even named a mountain pass that her up on Mount Whitney after Holder Crooks because of her love of active movement and um, being out in nature. So I wanna encourage you guys, um, follow Holda, get going, take some people with you, Holda Crooks used it to help her heal. After the death of her husband and the death of her son, she decided, I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna get moving. I have this love for nature. I'm gonna learn more about it and take people with me. So you guys, um, we're coming near the end and I wanna save some time and open it up for questions, but I wanna encourage you, you can connect with me. This is my email. Anytime, if you have questions, I am going to be um, one of these days um, probably here in the near future, within a month or so, starting a podcast to help people learn how to delay aging um, and put into practice what the centenarians say. There is a book I have called Raising Resilient Kids. It's available wherever. I won this Nautilus Literary Award for this. If you guys want this, it's available. There in the back is a self-assessment survey where you can take a survey and see how you compare to what the centenarians practice along with recipes um, and things like that. Um, if you guys are interested in taking a survey, one of my students is looking at lifestyle and COVID and she's expanding her um, reach uh, to include anybody over 75 um, interested in taking part. You can take a picture of the QR code um, and then she's gonna publish the 
publish the findings. So one of the things I want to remind you guys is that if you're living a life, remember breakthroughs happen when your limiting thoughts and your modern daily habits are challenged. So I want to encourage us all this year to take a look at what we're doing and see if it's fulfilling what we imagine for ourselves, right? And if not, to begin taking the steps to, to make those changes and, and to live how we want to live. Okay, so um, that's the end. And I, I'm going to stop the share and turn it back over to our host and see what questions. But it's a lot of information, but um, just little pieces, little changes, right? Not an overall haul, but little things that you can do. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Spencer. Um, amazing. I have so many notes myself. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to doing my wheel. And I will tell you, and some of my students are in here, they know how busy I can get. My wheel's going to be a little distorted, but we're going to fix that. We do have a few questions and I have some others. So we're going to start with some of the ones that, that some of the students have been, uh, have been asking. The first one is, um, can you share any inf information about Sister Andre, who just died at 118? Do you think she really, she was really the oldest person alive, or are there older people still alive? Oh, I saw her. It's very, um, yeah, very happy, long life she lived. And, you know, I think there are probably older people still alive, maybe even older than her, older than they know, because some of the regions we don't have all the great records, right? And some of the communities where you have the oldest, um, they're some of the poorest and they don't keep track of all of these things. So um, yeah, but pushing up to 120 is, uh, you know, that's as far as I know, but her living at 118 is one of the oldest. Another one I knew here in the US was a pediatrician, 115. She was still practicing pediatrics well into her hundreds and yeah, she was a pediatrician and her motto was um, doing things, um, you know, uh, not so much medications, but more of the lifestyle and simplified living. That was her approach to how she handled. But probably, yes, to answer the question, I'll bet you there are more people older than, you know, we realize. <laughs> Excellent. And here's another interesting question. Um, what is the advantage of having an animal? And then also... Oh. Does having a sense of humor help us deal with stress? So very good animal Okay, so Dr. Ellsworth Wareham had two dogs, right? That that I didn't share that with him, but that is true. There is something about the pets, and all of these people grew up around animals. They had animals in their life. Um, and so as farmers, right, you're around that. So there definitely is something to help the aging process. And um, not only, it could also help you find a purpose in getting outdoors. If you have to take that animal and walk it, um, you know, it's a great way to encourage you to get outdoors. So definitely there's a link, I believe, with reducing stress and having pets. Um, humor is also something else. These people, um, when I was interviewing them about the trauma, they were able to shift focus and then begin laughing of other things in their life. So they didn't focus on that, but they were able to find enjoyment and humor. So definitely um, the medicine, a merry heart do is good, like medicine is what they say, right? So there is, there is and there is scientific evidence to show humor um, does help promote healing and longevity. Excellent. Um, we have another um, question to that. Uh, this student wants to talk about the role of medication and yoga to slow down. Okay, so one of the things you want to be careful is, you know, is, yes, I, I promote, I'm, I'm a proponent of medication. If you, if you need it, you can't, with, you know, if it, things aren't working, my husband takes medication, so I believe we should. But again, medications all typically, there's a side effect right? It's not without something. So you have to, you want to try to do the things you can in your life to offset the need for the medication or to reduce the need. But when it's there, we're going to, we need it, right? And so um, do what you can, do the best you can. And even when you are taking medication, like my husband still, he's reduced the amount he takes because we've improved some of our lifestyle, but he still needs cholesterol meds and we take it. Um, so yes. And yoga 
right? If that helps you to relax and de-stress, you know, I'm, I am all for that, right? Finding ways to add movement. One of the things you might want to encourage um, to do if it's just yoga is finding ways that you're also building muscle, right? Because mm -hmm. yoga, I'm not so familiar if yoga is as more physically strenuous as like bailing hay or doing other things, right? Or the pots and pans that the centenarians use was um, they weighed a ton. So you want to get muscles involved too, but both, yeah. Excellent. And then um, we have another question. Are there, um, it says, while peanuts are legumes, do they still have the same benefit of true nuts? So you had said all nuts, and that's a great question because yeah, yeah. we hear so yeah. many things like, I think last week, pistachios were the best nuts. And then they say, but walnuts are still good yeah. for you. I mean, yeah. how do we know? So, okay, so a full disclosure, I wasn't the one involved with the nut study, though I do know um, walnuts were one that they have found from a feeding trial. And there was another one, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Walnuts were one and because um, they do feeding trials. If you go on the Loma Linda website, you will see the studies about the nuts and you can pull them up. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing off the top of my head. But you know what I say is, um, if you're, you're focused on eating nuts, a wide variety is always good. Because some of this bacteria in our gut, we the good bacteria in your gut we need, we don't always know necessarily what promotes the good bacteria. So when I, so thus I say, eating a wide variety of nuts and fruits and vegetables, you're more likely to find something that works, right? And we may not even fully know it, but you may be hitting it on the head, right? So wide variety is good. Um, yeah, and, and as far as which nuts are better than others, I have heard from the Advent Health Study, the Brazilian tree nuts, that's one they really love. But you'll have to pull the research and see. <laughs> okay, but I do like that wide variety because I love all kinds of nuts. <laughs> yes. There you go. All right. And then here's another question. Um, do you, uh, what are your opinions on brain training, brain training exercises to maintain mental activity? Me personally, I think brain training is boring. So I don't, you know, right. That's just my thought. Um, I'm going to go out and do things like I'm going to go help people. And um, I want to be involved. I want to teach. I imagine I'll be teaching and doing this well into my 80s. I told my <laughs> Right. So for me, um, just focusing on that, it wouldn't be I, it wouldn't be sustainable. So you have to find something that's sustainable and that you enjoy. Right. And so if you're out learning new hobbies and then using that hobby to help someone, you're more likely to hit on that wheel. When I say eases in the overlap, more of those eight habits, you're more likely to hit than if you were just to do, say, sit in your office and like focus, focus on a brain training. It's probably better to do more things. Excellent. I like that. Um, and here's another question. Um, well, they want to know with, with going back to the nuts, um, what is the quantity? You know, I mean, within reason, like. Yeah, handful, handful. Yeah. I, I handful see my, my grandmother who actually lived to be 94, um, Wisconsin farm girl, and such that's how she would measure things by yes. how much nuts grandma this much yes. you know yes. how much yes. flour for your tortillas this much yes you don't want to sit and eat the whole jar of nuts because right. nuts are high calorie right but it's a good calorie so we just say a handful of nuts excellent and then um also um the student writes you mentioned meat does that include uh turkey pork salmon chicken as being as bad as red meat or red meat red meat is more one of the culprits that they have found it does fuel that bad bacteria in your gut that's linked with these other things so if you're if you're weighing the ability to produce the bad bacteria red meat is the one right and so you can switch however there are benefits to say fish right the omega-3 fatty acids so if you can switch from red and, and chicken and pork to more of the lean, um, you know, fish on the other end, it's much better, right? So, so like, the, like this continuum. Yeah, I, I was say it's, it's almost like a spectrum where red is like the red meat, even though we all love our good steak every once in a while. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. You know, that's at one end of the spectrum and those very lean uh, fish proteins are on the other edge. 
and you want to try to stay with the, the leaner. Yeah. And one of the things you might consider doing, though, it's not that great, but if you're one of those that you love a steak every night, is figuring out ways you can reduce that and substitute things. And they do have like, so it is completely processed, a fake vegetarian hamburger things, you know, like you can try something beyond burger or grillers or things like that to try to help. Um, and then increasing the amount of vegetables that you serve in a meal. So rather than one vegetable, maybe serve two. Yes. So that you're filling more with some of these others, right? But there's, it's, diet is never, I say it's not black and white, right? And don't beat yourself up. It's just kind of making these gradual changes um, toward, you know, less. Yes, yes. Well, here's an interesting question that comes up because we've been hearing a lot about this. And this student asks, are there any studies linking intermittent fasting to longevity? Um, that seems to be like the latest trend. Yeah, know. yeah. I haven't seen any studies. What I do see studies of is reduced calories, reduced calories. So the centenarians, if you look at their life, um, it was one of, of limited calories, especially um, throughout their lifespan. They didn't have excess, right? And so reducing the calories overall, we see in the Adventist Health Study that your body weight, the amount that you're carrying is, is important for your health and um, delaying the aging. So that's important. The fasting, um, the long-term outcome, I haven't seen any studies because I wonder, you know, um, your other habits of daily living may overshadow. So if you do a fasting one day, how does that look over the week? Or are you going to fast one day of the week for every day of the year? Right, so what is sustainable, or is it more sustainable? You're going to reduce some of those calories as you go along, right? That right. you have to pick and choose. Yeah, excellent. Um, and this student actually asked an excellent question, uh, especially with today, uh, especially kind of post-pandemic. Oh, yes. um, should we reduce our computer and iPhone use, and then, of course, accept our online courses? And, <laughs> you know, online courses, no. <laughs> I love this student. Okay, you guys, so here's the kicker. There is studies now linking, and I think one of the studies is linking this blue light and even the lights in general to increase risk of diabetes. So one of the things I say is um, the light does disrupt your ability to sleep at night, right? So, and that is so important. So yeah, you want to try to limit the amount of time, especially right before you're like, at least I try to say two hours before you go to bed, don't be in front of this screen. And then even you might even think of, and I talk about this in my book, is how you even can set the stage for your room at night. Like some may even think of the clock, is the clock glaring light in your room? Because a lot of this light disrupts not only your sleep, but how deep you go. And they have studies showing. Or is there light coming in from the street where you're sleeping? The centenarians didn't have this problem because there was no light when they were growing up, right? Yeah. But it's really important to your health. Um, are you binging on Netflix? Which, okay, before I did this journey, my night consisted of put my daughter to bed and then binge on my Netflix right there by bed, right? And put my phone down. And then I'd wake up at three in the morning and binge a little more and put my phone down. That is not good, right? right. Your, your rest is so important to even your cholesterol levels, to your stress levels, to everything. So reduce it. If it prevents you from going outside and seeing things, you know, it's definitely not great. So try to reduce and especially around two hours before you sleep. Okay, excellent. And that, um, all of my students, I'm writing that one down, everyone. <laughs> if I, so hopefully you'll stop seeing me answering emails at 1230 in the morning. <laughs> I'm so yes. Yes. So guilty. Um, uh, so here's some more uh, some great questions, and and I'll thank you, everyone. We're going to try to get to as many as possible. Uh, so this student asked, do any of those in the blue zone at Loma Linda take supplements? Oh yeah, there's a number that do take supplements. Um, they, you know, even I I take a multivitamin a day just to make sure. Yeah. But again, the supplements that you take is it as good as what's coming from nature? So they have studies of like vitamin D, right? The supplement you take or from what you get in nature and it's two different types. 
the kind you get in nature, how your body makes from the sunlight, vitamin D, it stores in your body um, versus the kind that you take as a supplement, your body can't store for reserves. It's different. So it's always better if you can get it from nature, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't hurt to supplement and have things, right? Okay, excellent. Here's another question. Can inflammation be measured? And how can you tell if you have high inflammation? Ah, okay. So yes, inflammation can be measured. There is a protein called CRP, C-reactive protein. And this is the culprit. They are finding this inflammatory marker in the plaques where people have dementia. They find it there. They find it in the lining of your vessels for heart disease. It's throughout. And you can go and have it measured, but I'm sure it costs money somewhere. And, and I didn't have much money. So I fight it by just knowing what are the habits that I'm doing and looking at it. And the more plant-based I eat, right? Those eight habits, the more you do of those, the more you fight that CRP. And if you are just sitting here and feeling like, oh, I gotta hurry. Like I know people have already gotten off there probably on the road or somewhere else driving to the next because I'm the same or I used to be. The more you are like that, you better believe the more your CRP is, is um, ticking up there. In fact, that is one study I would like to do is to measure that and see what the prevalence is of our, our country because we all feel like, especially in the pandemic, we're on edge. If someone cuts you off in traffic, you're gonna yell at them, hopefully not give them <laughs> any finger or anything like that, but you're gonna yell at them, right? And so that feeling and that boiling is an indicator that what's going on inside the body um, is going unchecked. Excellent, thank you. Um, here's another question. Unsalted nuts uh, tend to be hard, hard, are hard to find. And yes, that is so true. So does it matter between the salt and the unsalted or is it again, just that little handful? Well, you have to be careful if you're supposed to have a low salt diet, then you probably can't have the, yeah. Um, of course, the more natural the nuts, the better. But if you are going to add nuts to your diet and you absolutely refuse to eat the, the unsalted, then sure, eat the salted, right? But make sure that you aren't those that high blood pressure and need to watch the salt, kidney disease, mm -hmm. things like that. Excellent, thank you. Uh, that, here's an interesting one. Um, egg yolks are very good for the eyes, but are they a problem because they're an animal product? Oh, you know, I love eggs and I eat the whole thing. Um, for vegans who might not want the eggs, they might put, uh, you know, um, they might not want to eat that. But um, as far as studies go, um, I haven't seen too many um, egg studies where they're saying, you know, eggs is a causer of heart disease and things like that. I haven't seen too many. In fact, um, I like to eat eggs um, to offset some of my desire to eat some of the more bacon and some of the other stuff that you might have for breakfast. So I'm more going to eat the eggs. So not, not so much a big problem as say red meat. Excellent, good. Cause I do love my omelets. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna eat. I'm my gonna veggie eat. omelets, can't help it. Um, thank you. Uh, here's another one. Does uh, psychiatric therapy help to cause resiliency? Um, some, yes and no, I did do some research um, looking at resiliency among uh, trauma informed, so the ACEs that they had, and there was some, there was some signs that cognitive behavioral therapy was effective, uh, but, you know, more research is needed to really understand it better. Mm -hmm. If it makes you feel better and, and supports you, I think it's a tool you should use, right, and, and um, having to go to a therapist or needing to go or wanting to go to a therapist uh, may be an important part of recovery and healing. And we should use every tool at our dis at our you know dispose disposal at our at our availability. Use all your tools, and but don't use that as the only and avoid making changes in your life because if you do that only and that's it. Again, are you treating the symptoms or are you getting to the cause? Excellent, excellent. Because that that brings me to a question I was thinking about during your talk. Do our bodies remember stress? Yeah, there's a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so the body does remember stress, but you can heal from that as well. Okay. And so 
you aren't really defined. Like they used to say, you know, if you know your ACE score, you'll know your outcome, you'll know your longevity. Ah, but when I study these centenarians, it tips that all on its head. They're the ones that show you, no, you can have this trauma and it doesn't mean it's going to shorten your life or not even allow you to live this abundant life. Um, right. That you can, you can overcome that. And a big part of that is fighting that stress, finding ways. Excellent. And then like you were saying, to build that, the buffers. Yes. yes. And, it, and in seasons of your life, the buffers will change, right? Like you may have one season where you have big friends and that may offset the other bubble where maybe you're not able to get outdoors as much, right? And so you're going to go through these seasons that some may do better than others. Um, and that's just the way it is in life. Yeah. Um, so here's another question um, that I had down. The age, I think her name was Anita. Anita Mackey. Yeah. yeah Paul's here at the back. Because you had asked that typically you ask everyone to guess her age. And yeah. then you didn't give us her age. Ah, how old do you guys think she is? Um, did they tell you how old? Well, okay, let me ask. How old? You tell me. Well, I'll how just tell you what I think. Um, I'm going to guess, well, now, then maybe not so much, but I think now maybe like 102. No, back then in that picture, she's 105. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. These guys, I tell you. When you look at them, you wouldn't guess. You wouldn't think that a person who's 100 years old is going to be driving their own car, living independently, getting groceries. Um, but that's just the way of the life for them. Yeah. Wow. And then um, is, is there an easy, quote, first step? Or is it just, would you kind of close out saying just that, um, that realistic reflection of the state of your life? currently i mean is that like the what's like yes. one step. quick easy takeaway yep. yep okay so one quick easy takeaway for you guys is to really start and reflect on your schedules what does your schedule look like and where do you want to go what do you want to what do you want to be right is your life sustainable is that hectic pattern um do you do you like that where you're at, right? So looking at your schedules and really asking, that's what happened to me when I finally had that come to moment of, I don't like this. I don't want to live like this. I don't want to drive my car. I don't want to yell at my kids. I don't want to be this. Yeah. And that's what it is. And the book that I have, it takes you through an eight week program of going through this um, decompressing and doing. And um, if you ever want me back, we can go through even more the other living balance connected determined how do you begin to move towards that um it's a lot in an hour and a half <laughs> because it's a lifestyle right yes so yes. Just starting with that start with your schedule see what you think well i will say that let me where is my schedule because i've actually done two things to help me personally i actually got a smaller schedule book so on purpose i cannot fill that little block um with things i did that on purpose and i actually hide my schedule book now instead of having it on my desk where i'm faced with it every day i open it up look boom and i put it away so those are just two little helpful hints that i do as as that first step i do have if someone wants i do have um a cheat sheet a handout that goes with how do you evaluate your schedule so i have a full on if you like, I can share that if they want that. Sure. Like, how do you look and what are the questions you ask yourself before you start filling in, before you say yes, especially if you're a yes person? Yeah, yeah, excellent. Well, I just want to share a couple more things um, with the class. First of all, Dr. Spencer, thank you, thank you, thank you. This was so informative and I can't wait to digest all the information that I heard myself. Um, so a uh, quick question though for you, uh, Dr. Spencer, uh, about the Loma, Loma Linda Aging Study to participate. Am I able to uh, put that information in our Canvas shell, a yeah. uh, course shell in case yeah. some, okay, great. I always ask because sometimes there's rules with recent um, yeah. you know, stuff. Um, and then also um, unsalted nuts are always found on the baking aisle for those that want to. That's a great hint. Uh, one of the students wrote in if you needed to find unsalted nuts. Um, and then the handouts that uh, Dr. Spencer 
uh, mentioned were emailed to you and also put in an announcement. And then now that our lecture is done, I'm going to go ahead and put uh, post those in our Canvas shell under week one resources. I'll make a new page for us. And then I was also going to ask uh, Dr. Spencer if we can have that one slide of the eight steps, the one that you said to take a picture. And then um, we can do a PDF of that so yeah. that the students can have it. Yeah. Um, so then also in closing, um, one, thank you everyone for your time and, and coming and joining us. We couldn't do it, uh, especially without you. So at four o'clock this afternoon, and I did that so we have time to think about all that we've heard, two things will happen. A discussion board will open up and you're welcome to continue this conversation amongst each other. And then also um, a reflection, a writing activity. I don't call them assignments because here with Emeritus, uh, nothing is required, but strongly recommended. But this is your time to just give your impressions and your thoughts and reflections on today's lecture. It's for my eyes only. And both of these are open until next Thursday because our next speaker will be that next Friday. And I'm super excited to have Dr. Rocky Ruggiero uh, with us next week. And he is a world-renowned art historian. He has been in documentaries on the History Channel, uh, PBS, um, a great, great, um, just brilliant mind with Renaissance, all things the Renaissance. So he'll be joining us for our guest lecture next uh, Friday at 10 o'clock, I believe talking about the Medici chapels. So it should be interesting as well. Uh, so thank you again, everyone. Have a great day and we'll see you next week.